So last week we talked about the fact uh, that, um, let me see how I say it this way, that God has called everyone to be missionaries. God has called everyone to be evangelists, uh, not just a preacher, not just a pastor, but everybody um, in their way with their gift is called to be an evangelist, called to reach out to people. Let me give a few quotations uh, that fit along those lines. Quotation number one, somebody one time said uh, that, uh, somebody one time said that back in the day, uh, ministry used to be a verb to minister. Nowadays, ministry is a noun, a minister. And so we leave the work of ministry to a minister. But we need to get ministry from the noun back to the verb so that we don't just keep it to a minister, but it becomes to minister so that everyone knows that their role is to minister. It's not just for a minister. Is that making sense, everybody? Absolutely. And so that's the goal, right? The goal is that all of us are ministers. All of us are ministers. And all of us can reach others with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Here's the thing. The thing is that everyone has a challenge because the question that people ask is how? How do I practically reach people for the Lord? So that's what I want to talk about today because what I want to encourage this church to do is that I want to encourage everyone, A, to be using their gifts and talents to serve the Lord and B, as best as possible to be missionaries uh, and witnesses uh, wherever you find yourself to be. So today we're going to talk about how to do that. And we're going to look at a couple of Bible passages in order to help us do so. So we're going to pick it up. Uh, let's go to, I'm going to, I'm going to read a few passages for you, and I want you guys to also follow along in your Bible and see them as well. So we're going to kick it off by going to John chapter 4. And I'm going to make an observation from these passages. So we're going to kick it off with John 4. And I'm going to be in verse, John chapter 4, and I'm going to be first and foremost in verse 35. This is what Jesus says. He says, do you not say, John 4, 35. Well, let me pick it up at verse 34. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work, right? So Jesus was always a person. You know, we have a lot of people who are what we call self-starters, but never self-finishers. They can never finish what they started. And this is actually a big theme in the Gospel of John, that Jesus doesn't just start his father's work, he finishes his father's work. In other words, he stays the course, which is the theme for this church this entire year. He stays the course. Now, look at verse 35. He says, do you not say that there are still four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look at the fields, for they are already white for harvest. Okay, so the basic point Jesus is making is that there are already people there who are looking for Christ. They just need the person to go and reap them. Is everyone following so far? But anyway, that's not even the point I'm trying to make this evening. The point I'm trying to make this evening is that when Jesus, the key point I'm making this evening, I don't want anyone to miss it, is that when Jesus talks about soul winning, his favorite metaphor to use is that he loves using farming analogies. So that's why we see here he talks about harvest. Okay, let's look at some other examples. He talks about harvest. I think it's Matthew 9, it is. We go to Matthew 9. I hope it's Matthew 9. I'm recalling correctly. Yep, spot on. It's Matthew 9, and it's verse 37. I want you to see again. I'm landing at a point. I'm going somewhere today, but I'm laying the foundation for everybody. It's Matthew 9, verse 37. We're talking about the analogy that Jesus uses when he wants to describe the process of winning souls to Jesus. Okay, Matthew 30, chapter 9, verse 37. He says to his disciples, the harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Okay, so the same point Jesus is making in Matthew 9 was the same point he was making in John 4. A, that there are already people out there that, you see, this is why I always tell people, never be afraid to evangelize. 
Because before you go and evangelize, God is already evangelizing. <laughs> I always say, God is evangelizing before you evangelize. So when you go and evangelize, you're not doing something in isolation of what God is doing. You're doing something in cooperation with what God is doing. That's why the Bible always says that we're not just workers for Christ. The Bible actually uses a phrase. It says we are co-workers with Christ, co-laborers, because we're working with him, right? And that's why Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20, describe, we, we call it the great, listen to it carefully, the great, you see, we say commission, so we say it so fast, but slow it down. That's why we call it the great co-mission. Are you hearing that? Co, with, together, mission, the pursuit of something. We're doing this with Christ. Is everyone following so far? So Jesus is making that point. The harvest is already plentiful. But the point I want everyone to grasp is that, again, he is using farming analogy to describe the process of soul winning. Is everyone following? Let's look at one more evidence, one more text in order to substantiate this point. Uh, flip over to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians is a book that I love teaching. One day I will teach it. And you all love it. Today is not that day. First Corinthians. So I'm just making one point. I'm making one simple point because this point is going to serve as the foundation for everything else that I talk about. First Corinthians chapter four. And now we're going to hear the words of the apostle Paul. Okay. Notice what he says. He is describing his work in Corinth. And I think, nope, not chapter four. It's definitely going to be chapter three. All right, perfect. I'm going to pick it up at verse five. So we're in first Corinthians. We're in chapter three. And I'm going to be in verse five. I want you to observe what the word of God says. First Corinthians chapter three in verse five. Paul says, he says, who is Paul? And who is Apollos? Okay. He said, we're just ministers through whom you believed as the Lord gave to each one. Then notice what he says in verse six. He says, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. Notice what he says in verse seven. So then neither he who plants is anything, nor he who waters, but God who gives the increase. Okay, a lot of points can be mentioned over here. But pretty much what was happening in Corinth was that Corinth were trying to turn Paul, Apollos, even Peter into celebrity pastors. That's exactly what was, that was literally what was happening. They were trying to turn them into celebrity pastors. And so what was happening in the church of Corinth is that different camps were being formed. Matter of fact, if you study the letter to Corinthians carefully, the, the Greek text actually says, Different political parties were being formed within the church. It's deep. Different political parties. And the political parties were centering themselves around the different apostles. So you had the Paul party. You had the Peter party. You had the uh, Apollos party. Everyone following what's going on. Right? Doesn't that sound like 21st century? Yeah, so you see a lot of these problems are not new. Anyway, so Paul is trying to, uh, what is Paul trying to do? Paul is trying to, let me use a kind word to describe it. Paul is trying to whip them into shape and say, that is not of Christ. Everyone following the law. So in order to articulate that it's not of Christ, he says, who is Apollos? Who is Paul? We're just ministers. But then look at the analogy, the way he describes how they minister. He says, Paul planted farming. Apollos watered farming. God gave increased farming. Is everyone following the law? Okay. I've made my point clear that many times when the scripture talks about the process of soul winning, there's a lot of illustrations the scripture can use. Paul sometimes calls himself, Paul likes to also use construction analogies for soul winning. So sometimes he, call, he refers to himself as an architect who lays down a foundation. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, there's no other foundation that is to be laid than that which is already laid, and that is Christ Jesus. So he's describing himself as a master builder, an architect. But in this case, the dominant metaphor that dominates the Bible, 
when it talks about the process of soul winning, is the analogy of farming. Is everyone with me so far? Have I made my point very clear? Use three texts to substantiate it. All right, sounds good. Now, with that being said, I'm going to build off of it so that we can discover how we can be effective evangelists in our day-to-day -day life. This is for everybody. Everyone can take notes from this. All right. So in order to be effective evangelists, I've been teaching this for years, and it's what I even use till this day. To be an effective evangelist, and when I say evangelist, I'm not talking about um, preaching from the pulpit. I'm talking about one-on-one -on -one working with people. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? Okay. So there is four stages. This is good stuff right here. This is great stuff. I really want to keep this in mind. There is four stages to evangelism. Four stages. Till this, I follow this process. Always following this process. It's what I use in my mind all the time. It's my system. It's my model. And, 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 and you see, when you become, uh, 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 when, you, when you do this so much, you will be able to realize when you are in different stages with a person. I'm telling you, this is really good. You want to keep it. These four stages align with the four stages of farming, four stages of growing a crop. Now, I'm not no farmer, but every time I taught this lesson, I taught it with farmers. So farmers always confirmed that I was teaching the right thing. <laughs> I, every time I taught it, I taught it in farmers right in front of me. Every time I taught it. And so I think I'm on the right page with it. All right. So let's talk about the process of farming. Say I'm trying to grow crops, Bill. Um, what's, pop what's a popular thing to grow out here in Toledo? I don't even know. Corn, soybean. Okay, standard American stuff. Perfect. All right. So we got, we got corn. I'm trying to do a big corn field. Talk to me, everybody. If I'm trying to do this big corn field, what's my first step? What am I, what am I going to do first? I got, I bought the land already. So don't worry about that. I got the land already. What do I need to do first? If I'm going to go ahead and start planting this and start uh, developing this corn. Talk to me somebody. Huh? All right. Gary got it. Talking like a true farmer himself. All right. So again, <laughs> Oh, your grandfather was a farmer. Okay. Perfect. So the first stage that Gary is describing. And this is stage one of evangelism. It's called the stage of cultivation. The stage of cultivation. When you're engaged in farming, the first thing you've got to do is cultivate the land. In the same way, when you're engaged in evangelism, the first stage is cultivation with that person. Okay, Kojo, what does cultivation mean? What happens? in the cultivation stage. Here it is. In the cultivation stage, what you're trying to do is that you're trying to prepare that person for what's going to come next. How do you prepare that person for what's going to come next? I'm going to give you the answer. You've got to build trust with that person. That's it. That's your first thing. So Sandy, and we're going to get to something practical when this is all done. But if you're seeking to tell someone about Jesus, bring that person to Christ, eventually bring that person to the church so they can be part of this church fellowship, your first job with that person is to learn how to build trust with that person. And I'll tell you why. Many times, before people can trust the message, they often want to see if they can trust the messenger. Yeah? It's true. Sometimes people can preach a true message. They'll reject the message just because they don't like the messenger. They'll feel like the messenger is sleazy. <laughs> They'll look at the messenger and say, no way. A lot of times, right? A lot of times before people can trust the message, they want to see if they can trust the messenger. Therefore, you as the messenger has to make sure you come off as a person who can be trustworthy. That's why in evangelism, one of the critical steps of evangelism is making sure that you yourself have a growing relationship with Jesus every day. Notice I didn't say a perfect relationship with Jesus every day, but a growing relationship with Jesus every day. Why? So that Christ in you shines forth as you're communicating with people. Because what does that help do? It helps build trust. Does everyone follow along? Okay. What is the greatest ways? that trust is cultivated 
I tell you the answer, relationship. Therefore, if you're going to be an effective soul winner, your first step in cultivation is to build trust by developing rapport or relationship with people. Is everyone following along real quick? And so everyone knows the secrets of relationship building. Take a, and here it is, because a lot of people say all the time, well, how do you effectively build relationship? You know, the, the way, I'm going to give the simple answer. The way to effectively build relationship is to take genuine interest in the other person. What I just said right now is so simple, it's so profound, but a lot of people don't practice. Do you know how many people I talk to, and as soon as I start talking to them, all they want to talk about is themselves constantly. <laughs> now, this is before I, they even know I'm a pastor. I'm just a regular person. They want to constantly talk about themselves, themselves, themselves. You don't connect with somebody if all you keep doing is talk about yourself. Is everyone following along? You connect with people when you take a genuine interest in them. And it has to be genuine, right? So how are you doing? What's your name? Where are you from? I'm going to give you a trick. Again, my brain, I always use systems to guide me. So even when I'm trying to build a relationship with someone for the first time, I have a system I follow. I'm about to give you the system. The system is called, well, there's a lot of different names for it. So let me see. Um, let's see. Yeah, uh, well, yeah, OK. The system is called FORM, F-O-R-M, F-O-R-M. The system is called FORM. I'm telling you, give me the best stuff today. The system, this is all the secrets I use. The system is called FORM. It works like a charm every time I'm talking to somebody. F stands for family. If I want to start building a relationship with someone, Bill, this is how I do it. Bill, I never met you before. Just watch, and you all just watch me. Watch me when I deal with people that I've never met before. I follow in this system. Just watch me doing community dinner. Watch me in church service. If you, if you eavesdrop on my conversation, you will notice that I'm using this system. F stands for family. You want to take a genuine interest in someone? Always ask about their family. It makes someone feel like they care. Why? Because that's one of the greatest things people care about. Their family. Exactly. Shoot, you could just stay on family forever. Talk about the kids. Talk about, you know, over in Toledo First, the other church, man, we had such a great fall blast. We baptized quite a few folks. And then afterwards now, we're, we're doing the follow-up work. You know, we're getting people to come back out, so on and so forth. And it's tremendous. You know, a prayer meeting yesterday, we had about 17 of them over there. It was wonderful. And, um, you know, we were taking one of them home uh, because we were doing rides. And, um, you know, the first time we brought this person to church, uh, the person was very quiet. Didn't want to say a word. Didn't open up about anything. Thank God for my wife. So my wife is in the car, and she's sitting there, and she starts asking questions about family starts asking questions about the kids let me see the kid let me see the godson all of a sudden the person is showing pictures guess what the person is lighting up person is opening up person is getting excited because they just talk about their family person texts me the next day pastor kojo we love your church we want to come next saturday pastor kojo we can now bring my husband is coming to church this weekend so last weekend husband came to church wife was there at church kid was there at church then Th th this weekend, husband's coming to church, wife's coming to church, two other individuals are coming to church. You see, just because, and I said, and so I asked the person, I said, so, so why, why, what, what are you, why, why are you coming to church? Well, I, the person looked and said, well, I feel like this is a church that number one, makes me feel at ease, makes me feel comfortable, and the people are taking a genuine interest in me. You see that? It got nothing to do with our music, got nothing to do with our preaching. Got everything to do with it feel T word. It feels like trust is developing evangelism. This is why I'm just trying to bring it home to everybody and say, all of you have people in your sphere of influence whom you have the opportunity to build trust with. Do it by simply taking a genuine interest in. Okay. Oh, what is oh? Now nowadays, nowadays this gets a little harder to talk about sometimes. But um, you can find ways to break it up because uh, especially, uh, interesting enough, well, well, for men and women, this is kind of like a stereotype, what I'm going to say right now. Um, but, you know, it's generally true. It's not all the way true, but it's generally true. But anyway, what I'm going to say right now is occupation. O stands for occupation. And that's another thing you can bring up in the conversation. Um, now, some people don't work. 
So sometimes some people may even feel offended if you ask them about work, right? So instead of asking directly about work, well, I just simply like to say, what do you like to do? <laughs> just make it simple, like, what do you like to do? What do you enjoy doing, right? And so from there, we can have different conversations because you can get into hobbies, you can get to how you like to spend your time, you can even get a little bit into, let's say, acro occupation. From there, I can get into your education, whether it was high school, whether it's middle school, I can get to where you worked at. And what I like to do all the time is that then I, I, I keep it up with follow up questions. Okay, you work, you work at that plant. Okay, then you see, you see, here's the mistake everybody makes. I'm telling you, it happens in conversations all the time. Sandy, it goes just like this. Oh, okay, yeah, I work at, I work at a Jeep plant over there. You know the mistake everybody does? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My son also works at the G. Why'd you make it about you all of a sudden? <laughs> it happens all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My son works at the G plant too. Then you start talking about yourself all over again. You see, that's always a mistake. You keep taking the genuine interest in that person. Stop inserting yourself in the situation so fast all the time. Wow, that's great. That's fantastic. What do you love the most about working in that G plant? How long have you been that? Melt that thing a little bit more. You know, don't just switch into talking about yourself so fast. Work that thing a little bit. What, what do you like most about working at you? What's your favorite thing about doing that? Now, I know some of you all are sitting here saying this is an extroverted thing. I don't believe it's an extroverted thing. Actually, research will actually tell you that when introverts are one-on-one -on -one with somebody, they talk more than extroverts all the time, 100%. And I've actually just tested that theory constantly. People who are typically introverted, they just don't like working big crowds. But you get them one on one, you start talking to them, you make them feel comfortable because they keep it all in. You make them feel comfortable, start pouring it all out. So what I'm teaching right now is it doesn't have to deal with personality. All it has to deal with is skills. This is the skills. These are skills that can be learned. So anyway, the, the point that I'm making is take a genuine interest, ask follow up questions. Now, here's the thing. Don't make the mistake I made when I was first trying this out. I, I remember one time I was in New York. I was on the train. And, you know, this is the first time. This is like when I finally, like, really, you know, Christ took a hold of my heart, and I was really trying to be an evangelist everywhere I went. So, you know, I was trying to, you know, evangelize somebody on the train, and I start doing what I'm telling you guys. You know, I'm starting asking all these questions. And the lady looks at me, are you the FBI or something? I said, all right. <laughs> I said, all right, all right. I got I to gotta back it up a little bit. I said, I got to back it up. So, so then that's when I learned, okay, it got to be a little bit of a give and take. You know what I mean? Can't just do a line of questioning like that. You know, people can feel very uncomfortable with it, right? Uh, you know, and it can't be back to back to back to back to back, right? So it's just got to flow. It's got to be a little bit natural. Yeah, you toss. So, yeah, then you toss in a little bit about yourself or you toss in a little bit what you know, but then you go back into taking genuine interest in them, right? It's almost like a balance. It's like a dance. All right, so that's the next thing that's over. O, then R. R stands for two things. R can either stand for recreation, things people like to do for fun, but that's another simple conversation. What do you like to do for fun? What do you do for fun out here? You know, that's a, that's a question I like. To, what do you do for fun? And that could start a great conversation. Well, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm into basketball. Oh, for real? Tell me. You resist the urge to immediately talk about yourself. Resist it. Resist it. I know it's hard. But everybody wants to do it. Everybody wants to say, oh, you play basketball? I play basketball, too. Yeah, everybody wants to go into that. But resist the urge to immediately talk about yourself. Work with the other person. Oh, for real, you love basketball. Tell me about it. What, what do you love about it? Man, did you used to play back in high school? Oh, did you see, you see, you see how I'm working this thing? Did you used to play back in high school? Did you play? What are you doing here? You're taking a genuine interest and you're building trust with that person. Yeah, then after you show them, then you can tell them a little bit more. Yeah, I used to also play back in high school as well. Then, you know, you can get into it. And sometimes the way it works, not all the time, but sometimes the way it works is as you take interest in that person, that person can take a little bit more interest in you and then a, a nice relationship starts building. So R can stand for recreation, but R can also stand for religion. Well, sometimes uh, that's a question I could ask in, right? I could say, oh, okay, sounds good. I said, is there a church in the area that you like attending? Is there a church that you typically go to? You know, so you could, I could also throw out that question. Sometimes I don't throw it out too fast, but that's also an angle. I'm just showing you how I go through the system. That M, M, M stands for message. M stands for message. This typically comes at the tail end after we've talked a little bit while if there's a little way I can give us a, a small encouragement. Hey, you know, yeah, you're doing a great job. You know, people always, you know, how to win friends and influence people is Kevin's one of his favorite books. And it talks about that all the time. You know, uh, people who win friends and influence others are people who generally affirm others, who generally encourage others. 
everyone like you know you know they say that you attract more honeys with bees than with vinegar with bee, with, you have you tra attract more bees with honey than with vinegar i'm all jacked up sally <laughs> with bees than with vinegar right and that's the same thing you notice that people who affirm and encourage attract people who talk about problems and criticize repel yeah if you always talk about problems you're gonna be repelling people ain't nobody want to be around that energy you know why Because everybody else got their own problems <laughs> they have to keep hearing about yours i'm just keeping it real I'm gonna, come on so i'm keeping it 100 right but if you're a person who when they come around you you affirm you encourage right now you don't gotta be you don't gotta be uh insincere with it you know you don't gotta be over the top with it you can be genuine with it you see what i'm saying you can be calm with it you natural with it and i'm telling you what gets celebrated i'll tell you a couple of things what gets celebrated often gets repeated so therefore if you celebrate somebody they often want to come back right because you know you're going to find something in them to continually celebrate and that's an addictive that's a hook you know i think it was mark twain who one time said i, I can live off of a compliment for three months you know and what he was just talking about was the power and the value of affirmation that sometimes one affirmation to someone is enough of what they need to keep on going for a while so anyway that's system of how to engage with people and build trust build relationships any comment anything that anybody wants to share on that real quick any question before i get into the next stage of evangelism everybody real quiet that means i'm either making no sense or i'm making all the sense <laughs> I'm making all the sense in the world, so there's no question. So it's hard to read it. Yeah, Stella. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Now it's his. It is. It's absolutely his. But it is his as he works through you, right? And so, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, and so, I always say that ministry is a divine human cooperation. There is a divine part but there's also the human part. But today is what I'm talking about is the human part, right? The skills that we can develop in order to, and again, what I'm talking about right now are simple ways when we come in contact with people, very easy, neighbors, right? Neighbors, uh, family members are the hardest, but even family members. And that's the thing, you know, it's, it's important to be intentional, right? Of building relationships. Uh, somebody one time said, that we shouldn't just be social to social. We have to be social to save, but you still have to be social. And when I say social, I'm not talking about being a social butterfly. I'm not talking about being an extrovert. I'm talking about just making an intentional effort to connect with somebody, even if it's one body, makes a difference in the world. All right, um, are we good on stage one? Perfect, so we've talked about stage one, which is cultivation. Now, Gary, you're the resident farmer here, so keep helping us in the process. I've cultivated my land, I'm trying to develop corn. Um, what's my next step after I cultivate? Got to plant that seed. Got to plant that seed. That is stage number two of evangelism. Stage number two of evangelism is what we call the stage of planting. The state. Now, let me back up to the stage of cultivation real quick. Okay, before I know, Bill, so take it back in your notes. This is good stuff, everybody. I wish more people were here to hear it tonight. When you're in the cultivation stage, are you ready, everybody? This is, this is a key point, very key point. The way you, of course, the way you know you're in the cultivation stage if you've just initially met somebody and you have no relationship with them. But the sec, this is gonna be powerful, don't miss it. The second way you know that you're in the cultivation stage with somebody is when they have emotional obstacles towards accepting Christ. You see, there are all type of obstacles towards accepting Christ, and each stage has its obstacle. Stage one is the emotional one. Pastor Kojo, what's the emotional one? When people come to you and say, I don't, I don't do the church thing because when I grew up in church, there were so many people that were gossiping about me. You hear that? That's emotional obstacle. There's still some pain there, you see? There's still some hurt there. I don't believe in God because I was abandoned as a child. Why would God ever do that to me? See, that's an emotional pain that's there, right? 
I don't believe in God because I was married to someone who claimed they were a Christian and they ended up abusing me. Okay, that is an emotional obstacle that is there. Is everyone following along? So what's happening now is that what's making that person, what's making it difficult for that person to reach Christ is there's an emotional blockage. The only way to conquer emotional blockage is when trust is restored through relationship. That's it. That's just it. I don't like churches because churches are always taking money from me. You see? You see, that's why doing Summer Black, because somebody asked me in Summer Black one time, are you going to take an offering? I said, I'm not going to take an offering. And the reason why I'm, going, I'm not going to take an offering is because right now there's a lot of distrust towards church and religion. So the folks may think that I just brought them out here to take their money. Is everyone following along? And so because of that, I won't do it as a way to build T-word trust. You see? Oh, that's why, you see, and even trust building, you see, as a speaker, I'm always trying to build trust. So that's why I may start off with saying, my name is Koja. I'm going to be your host. See, I don't say I'm, I'm Koja, I'm going to be your pastor. You see? That, you see, the term pastor can say so much in somebody's mind. Because somebody can hear the word pastor, and they think about a pastor who ran them out the church. They think about a pastor who wasn't faithful. They think, you see, so that becomes an obstacle. So I just start saying, I'm, I'm, I, that's why many times when people say, who, who are you? I just say, I'm Koja. <laughs> I don't want to put that emotional blockage there immediately. Or I'll say, Koja, I'm your host. Why? Because when you think of a host, it, what, what comes into your mind? What comes into your mind is somebody who hosted you in your house and made you feel good, relaxed, comfortable, trying to build trust, trying to remove emotional obstacles. Is everyone here in the psychology behind this? Trying to evangelize. All right. I only got 27 minutes left. Let me land this point home. So is this helpful so far? Am I, am I teaching some okay stuff? All right. Second stage is planting. Paul says, I planted, right? Planting. Paulo said, I watered, right? So planting. Okay, let's talk about the planting phase. What's happening in the planting phase is that now, Joe, you've talked to somebody and you finally built a rapport with them. You've built a relationship with them. Okay. In the planting phase is where now that you've won the relationship, you've won the trust. Now, all along the cultivation stage, you're praying for the person. God opened that person's heart to hear truth. Planting phase, now you are communicating to them truths about Jesus from the Bible. That's where teaching them something from the Bible or teaching them something about Jesus starts to happen in the planting phase. Planting is where you're actually sowing into them spiritual knowledge. Let's talk about that. Why don't you take your Bible, go to Acts chapter 16. I'm going to show you something there. It's a small little verse. A lot of people usually miss it. Um, I missed it for years until I was doing a presentation one time, and somebody else actually pointed it out to me. Um, Acts 16, I thought it was pretty cool. This is Paul. He's evangelizing, right? Ooh, where am I? Okay, Paul. We're in Acts chapter 16, verse 13. Acts 16 and verse 13. This is a good lesson. Good lesson. Acts 16, 13. All right, I'm going to kick it up. Acts 16, 13. Here's what the word of God says. It says, and on the Sabbath day. This is Paul. So notice, you see a lot of people say the Sabbath was done away with. But it's so interesting because, first and foremost, this is Luke who is right in this. And Luke is acknowledging that the Sabbath day, first and foremost, exists. So, first of all, he talks about on the Sabbath day, notice, we went out of the city to the riverside where prayer was customarily made. So, notice, okay, I want to I just say something about the Sabbath real quick. Okay, a lot of people think that the apostles, especially Paul, only kept the Sabbath because the Sabbath was the way to go to the Jewish synagogues to talk to the Jews about salvation. But in this instance, Paul is not in Jewish territory. 
Paul is actually in pagan territory. And so there were no Jewish synagogues for him to go out and talk to any Jews. Therefore, Paul was simply looking for a place of prayer because Paul was trying to keep the Sabbath. <laughs> Paul was trying to keep the Sabbath and Paul was trying to worship. That's what Paul was trying to do. Paul was not going to no synagogue. You don't read about no synagogue over here. He was just simply going to worship uh, because the Sabbath day is a day for worship, period. All right, let's keep on going. So he was going for a place where prayer was customarily made. And when we sat down, we spoke to the woman who we met there. Now, a certain woman was named Lydia. She heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira, and she worshiped God. Now, look at the next statement the Bible makes powerful. It says, the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. I want to underscore that line. The Lord opened her heart. Let's talk about that, everybody. You can't get to the planting phase with someone if the Lord doesn't open their hearts. So it's got to be a thing of prayer. You're building the relationship in the cultivation stage. And as you're building that relationship, you're saying, Lord, open that person's heart so that when I speak, they can heed the things that are being said. Is everyone following along so far? All right, perfect, excellent. <clears throat> Y'all getting tired on me? Oh, we good so far. Still good? Y'all good? All right, come on, let's talk about it. Planting stage, what is your goal? Your goal is to help somebody understand gospel truths even clearer. What is your method? Your method is teaching them Bible truth. Now, I want to explain this carefully. Because when people say teach them Bible truth, they get very nervous. I'm not saying you have to be a pro at sitting down with somebody and giving them a Bible study. That is not what I'm saying. I'm not even saying you have to be a pro at preaching a sermon. That is not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that this is a great opportunity to be able to communicate with somebody some truths from the Bible. It could be truths from the Bible that where you communicate to the best level of how you understand it and where you communicate it to the best level of how you have grasped it. You understand what I'm saying? And so uh, you don't have to be a professional theologian here. You don't have to be a professional pastor here. Uh, this is why it's personally important to spend time in the Word of God for yourself. You understand what I'm saying? Uh, so that you could be able to help somebody out in this moment. Or there's a great opportunity. There's a great opportunity to be able to say, well, hey, my friend, it seems like you are very open towards learning more truths about God. Come to church with me. Because here we can be in a Bible study together. And this is a great opportunity for you to hear truth. You see how it is? So, Sally, you may feel like I'm not great at doing a Bible study myself. That's fine. Once you realize that that person is in stage two, they are open to now hearing gospel truth. You can say, well, let me invite you to a Bible study. And they can be able to hear the truth that way. You understand what's going on now? So you've built the relationship. It's easier to invite somebody once the relationship has now been built. Is everyone following along? So number one, you're building the relationship. Number two, you're in the planting stage. You're giving them truth. Now, what's the obstacle in this stage? The obstacle in this stage is that, the you see, in the first stage, the obstacle was emotional. In the second stage, the obstacle is intellectual. The obstacle is intellectual. At this point, the person has questions. So I'll give you a perfect example. I got a friend of mine. His name is called Ben Sprecker, and he's from Cincinnati. You know, the first time I met him, I'm talking about evangelism. I'm not, so I'm not telling you guys theory. I'm telling you guys things I actually practice. So when I was in Cincinnati, I used to pastor a church over there. I used to, uh, my responsibility was the younger generation. So one of the tasks that I would give the young adults, I, I divided them into three different teams. They had a socials team, they had a spiritual team, and they had a service team. And I told the social team that your responsibility is that every month or every other month, you got to plan outings for the young adults. So that's what they would do. And I said, the purpose of these outings 
is not just that so that we as a young adults can bond with each other. I said the purpose of these outings is so that we can invite our, our non-Christian friends, right? Our non-Adventist friends, our non-Christian friends to come so that we can build relationships, stage one. So great. So we did a, a social at Top Golf. By the way, there's no Top Golf in uh, Toledo. Yeah. In Columbus, that's the closest one, huh? That is serious. All right, anyway, so we went to Top Golf in Cincinnati. And I had a friend of mine called Jacob, uh, one of our young adults, Jacob Duncan, brought his friend, Ben Sprecher. And when he brought his friend, Brent Sprecher, Ben didn't even know I was the pastor. I didn't even, do, I was you know, wearing regular clothes. And, you know, Ben was sitting there and everyone was kind of in their clique. And that's why in church, I always encourage click free fellowship. Don't hang out in your clique, connect with everybody, right? And so, and I've already taught you now how to connect with everybody. Take genuine, because you see, everybody said, well, how do I have conversations with people? Easy. Take genuine interest in them. All right. So Ben comes. I see that everyone hang out with your click. Ben is sort of sitting by himself. And I said, this is not the point of this. The point is not for Ben to come here. Because the point is not top golf. We're not social to be social. We're social to save. But the point is evangelism. So I said, let me sit down and start talking with Ben. I sat down talk with Ben, took an interest in. We just talked. You know, he talked about, talked about his family. F, right? Four, he talked about his family, told me about his family. He talked about his occupation. He didn't have a job at the time. He told me how he was trying to get a job and talk about all that. He talked about his thing, the books he liked to read. And he talked about all that. That's all we did that whole night. We just spent time talking to each other and built rapport. And I said, Ben, feel free to call me anytime. You know I'm here. That was the start of a relationship. Just right there, simple and easy. We'll do that. We'll just keep up, keep up, keep up. And then in the relationship, you've got to find out a little bit of who I am and what I do. I'm a church. I, I'm a pastor. I'm a Christian. I love Jesus. I talk to him. All right, sounds good. And I was praying for him. Lord, open his heart. All right. One day I get a text message. Pull it up. You ready? This is Ben. Hey, Kojo, I have a few questions. Can you help me answer them? The brother had seven of them. How can I establish an organic relationship with God and Jesus? How can I talk with God and Jesus? How can I listen to him? What is spiritual blindness? How do I ask God to remove sin from my life? September 16th, sin from my life. Then he's asking about Seventh-day Adventists. What makes Seventh-day Adventists different from other denominations? Then he asked me number seven. Have you had an experience with God? What stage has Ben in at the moment? He's at that planting stage. Stage two. He's got intellectual obstacles. He's seeking answers to these questions. What has the Lord done at this moment? He has opened his heart. If I, had, if I didn't have a relationship with Ben, do you think he'd be texting me? Not a chance in the world. Is everyone following? And it started from a rendezvous at Top Golf. All right, stage three. Gary, help us out. I've planted, I'm watering. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So in that planting stage, you've got to keep attending to the person, like how you attend to those plants, right? Now that's not stage three yet. You've got to keep attending to the person in the planting stage. So. You see, we always think that evangelism is like clear cut. No, it's real mess. It's real, real mess. It's real, real mess. People are like flipping through all the space, space stages at different times. They go forward. They go five steps backwards. They go, they come three steps forward, 10 steps more backwards. But they're looking to see the person who wouldn't give up on them, like how God never gives up on us. So you stick with that person, just like how you're going to stick with those plants, right? You're going to keep weeding them. You're going to keep hacking at it. The animal's going to come and try to, you know, mess it up. But you ain't going to give up on that thing. You're going to keep watering it. It's going to be a little drought, so you're going to need a little bit more water. It's going to be too much water, so you don't have to deal with that. You have to keep with that plant. All right, as you do, finally, God's going to reward you. You get to stage number three. You ready for it? Stage three is the harvesting stage. The plant is now growing. Stop. You got to let that thing grow. You got to wait. And, and that's a big part of it right here. You got to be patient. You got to be patient. You got to be patient. That's the same thing evangelism people. With people, you've got 
to be patient. You can't rush them. You can't rush them. You've got to just simply move at their pace and God's timing. I'm almost done. Hang in there, everybody. You see, I would, normally I'll split this up over multiple weeks, but I think you all know I'm traveling, and so this is actually my last, so we're not going to have Bible study next week because it's Thanksgiving. And so this is my last um, Bible study I'm going to be teaching until I return back uh, from, from my travel. And so that's why I'm just loading it all right here. Or else right now I would have stopped so that you can digest it, and I would have come back the next week so that we can continue. But have I been making sense so far, everybody? Is this following along cleanly and smoothly? Excellent. All right, let's finish things off. So now we're in stage three, Bill, and stage three is the harvesting stage. This is what Jesus has talked about in, 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 in at least two verses in the gospel. The harvest is what? Plentiful. So what G I want everyone to catch what Jesus is saying. What Jesus is saying is that lots of people are already in stage three. <laughs> Lots of people are already in stage three. You, he, but what did Jesus say the problem is? The problem is the laborers. We don't got enough people working them out there. If there was more people working out there, we'll be finding the stage threes already. Finding them everywhere. And once you find the stage three, you quickly move through stage one. Build that relationship fast. Just be a, uh, be a, be a, be a person who's surrendered to Jesus. Let Jesus shine through you. Uh, 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 number two, you'll get through that, 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 that planting stage fast. You're right there at the harvesting stage. What's the harvesting stage? Let's talk about it. The harvesting stage, this is where you're helping someone make a decision to surrender their heart to Jesus and join a church body. I want to add those two to it. I want to add those two. I don't want to go as far as saying that, there's, there, there, that there is no accepting Christ without a church. I don't want to go as far as saying that because that's not 100% true. But what I will say is that a person who accepts Christ, eventually Christ will lead that person to accept the church. It's just how it works. How it, it's connected. I remember I had a professor who one time said, we don't accept Christ in a vacuum. We accept him in a context. We accept him in a community. Okay, y'all don't believe me. Show you text. Come on, y'all. First Corinthians 12. See, everyone thinks I'm making this up. I don't I really don't make stuff up. And if I'm ever making stuff up, I'll tell you I'm making it up. But I'm, I don't make it up. So first Corinthians 12. Let's see, is it 12? Yeah, it should be 12. Yeah, right here. 12, 13. I don't make it up. Come on, check it out. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 12, 13. Look at what the Bible says. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit, we were all baptized. But notice what we were baptized into. He says we were all baptized into one what? Anybody seeing it? body. <laughs> Estella, am I lying? Yeah. I'm spot on. And we're baptized into one body. In 1 Corinthians 12, body is metaphor for who? Church. He continues, whether, that, whether Jew or Greeks, slaves or free, they've all been made to drink into one spirit. In other words, baptism is not just into Christ. Baptism, yes, is into Christ but then it's also into his church. And who is his church? First and foremost, his church are all the people of God who trust and believe in Jesus Christ. And then as the end times roll along, who is his church? Revelation 12, right? Revelation 12, 14 says, his church, these are they who keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means that these are they whom when the spirit has convicted you about following what he has told you to do, you depend on his grace to follow through with it and the testimony of Jesus Christ or the faith of Jesus Christ. And you have your faith in Jesus, right? And so that's the people who are generally his church. The people whom when God reveals a commandment to you, whatever the commandment may be, you trust in his strength, you trust in his grace in order to walk in it. 
What am I trying to say, right? So this is a Seventh-day Adventist church over here. You can be attending a Seventh-day Adventist church, but you're not a part of Christ's church. Why? Why? Well, because there could be a commandment that God is telling you to do. Maybe it's a commandment to love your enemies, and you keep putting that off. <laughs> you keep rebelling. Maybe it's a commandment God's putting in your heart to forgive as you have been forgiven, and you keep putting that off. Maybe it's a commandment that God is putting on your heart to put away the idols. Huh? You know, there's a book that talks about the seven altars we worship on, modern idols, business, money, sports, entertainment, beauty, you know, those things. They're idols, but forget those things. The idols, anything that comes in between you and your God, right? And so it could be that. His genuine church are those who, when the Lord puts a commandment on your heart that you need to be following, that you say yes, Lord, to him. His church are the ones who always say yes to Jesus. The people who are in the church are the ones who say yes to Jesus. Does that make it sense, everybody? Yes to Jesus. Um, yes to Jesus. Yes to Jesus. And uh, hopefully in this church, I, I, I pray that all of us are saying yes to Jesus, right? It's the best yes that we can all say. Um, anyway, and, and we talk about churches, you know, how, how do you pick a church? I always say, I want to pick a church. I always say, I want to pick a church that when I look at the teachings of the Bible, they're doing their best to follow those teachings of, within the scriptures. Does everyone understand what I'm saying? I, you know, someone came to my office one day and said, hey, Pastor, I, I want to join the Seventh-day Adventist church. I said, okay. He said, but Pastor, I want to let you know something. If I find another church that is teaching the truth, I'm going to leave this church and go to that church. I said, when you find that church that day, take me along with you. I'm going to follow. <laughs> that's what I said. Because I want to be a part of a church that's teaching what? Bible what, everybody? Bible truth, right? And so uh, this, is, this is the idea behind it. All right. I got seven minutes left. You know, that clock is actually behind, so I think I have a little bit less. Yeah, I have five minutes left. Let's land this plane. All right. So what is the harvesting stage? You're helping a person make a decision for Christ and a decision to join his church, right? A lot of times, that is the process of a person getting baptized, right? Okay, so let's talk about it real quick. How do you help facilitate that? How do you, because I'm bringing it back home to you all as evangelists. How do you help facilitate that? Okay, in different ways. Number one, that person at that moment is not just experiencing emotional obstacles. That was stage one. They're not just experiencing intellectual obstacles, that was stage two. Now, they're experiencing volitional obstacles. Volitional obstacles. These are obstacles of the will. Obstacles of the will. Obstacles that is making it hard for them to actually make that concrete decision. These obstacles can be many. Well, pastor, you know, if I accept Christ, you know, um, you know I've, I've, been, I've been a sinner for too long. These are all the things I've heard in my life. I've been a sinner for too long. I don't think that God can forgive me, you know? I just feel that guilt on me, and I just can't get past it. You know, I can't get past that guilt, you know? Uh, volitional, right? We got another one. Uh, some other volitional obstacles are practical. Well, Pastor, you know, if I, if I, if I try to make a decision to follow Christ, well, all my family members, you know, they're pagans, or they're Muslims. I've dealt with a lot of that. They're Muslims, and they're going to cast me out. They're going to excommunicate me. I, I don't know how to handle it, right? That's a volitional obstacle, right? Uh, because they don't want to disappoint somebody else. Uh, you know, Pastor, I want to make a decision for Christ and, and join the church, but I just work a lot. You know, I work all the time. I just work all the time. All right, well, you can't make a little time for Jesus? Well, yeah, you know, it's just hard. I just work a lot, you know? So you see, that's, that's also there, too, all volitional obstacles. So what are you doing as the evangelist? Number one, the ministry of prayer. You're praying for them continually, that God removes that obstacle. What are you doing with that obstacle? You're sharing testimony. You know what? I had a civil... Now this is a good time to talk about yourself. I had a similar situation, you know, and, 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 and maybe it's not that exact one, but this was my obstacle. This is what made it hard for me. This is how the Lord helped me overcome it, right? So you're sharing testimony with that person. How are you helping that person come to the obstacle? You're inviting them to church. Keep coming to church. Maybe when the preacher is making the call, making the appeal, maybe they'll be able to say, you know what? Let me take my stand and follow Jesus, you see? So this is a practice. So I'm, I'm trying to take you from the beginning to the end, Bill. You're working with your coworker. You've built a relationship with him. You're praying that the Lord will open his heart. The Lord opens his heart. If somehow, some way, you're asking, he's developing spiritual interest. He's asking you questions about God. Maybe you're not the best to offer a Bible study. Kevin is great. Kevin, I got a great guy I want us to do Bible study with. Don't make the mistake of just transferring the guy to Kevin. Make sure you sit there in the Bible study together. Maybe that's not going to work nowadays. Say, hey, Thursday night, there's a great Bible study there. I'll pick you up. Let's come along for it. 
hey, Saturday morning is a great topic. I think it's exactly what you were asking me. Let's come, you know, this is how you're practically being that witness, that evangelist. You don't have to be a charismatic speaker. You don't have to be a, a, a big personality. It, it's just, who cares about all of that? It's just the trust you've now built with that person. Okay, now the person has come and you can clearly see this person is at a conviction point. I mean, I, I really got to start taking, you can clearly see it. What are you doing for that? There's stage three. What are you doing for that person now? You're praying for them. You're sharing testimony. And here's the biggest thing. You're making an appeal. Hey, will, that, that's the method. Yeah, yeah, take that note, Bill. Yeah, that's the method. You're making an appeal. Will you just, you know, Jesus made appeals all the time. You know, sometimes people talk about, oh, Pastor Cody, you make, you make too many appeals and you make them too long and you make them too strong. Look, Jesus made invitations too. He said, come, follow me. Matthew was that tax collector. Come, follow me. Rich young ruler invites, come follow me. Jesus made invitations. We can make invitations too. Come follow him, right? Follow me. Uh, and so that's what you're doing in that stage uh, three. Last stage. So now the person, not, not, now this is an ideal scenario. Everything is going well. Everything is going well, which is rarely goes this way. Now the person has made a decision for Christ. We're in stage number four. I'm, I'm finishing the lesson now. Stage number four. And this is now, Gary, we've, we've harvested the, the corn. Now, what do I do with it? I multiply its uses, right? I eat it. I can sell it. Uh, I get back down to its seed. I can replant it, right? I can do whatever with it now. I multiply its uses. Okay, that's the last stage of evangelism. A person has now come to Christ. They've now accepted it. What are you doing in the evangelism stage? I mean, sorry, what are you doing in the multiplying stage? I got you. I got you right now. In the multiplying stage, you're helping that person become an evangelist as well. That's what you're doing. You're saying, hey, now you have come to Christ. It's now time for you to help somebody come to Christ as well. Well, how do I do it? How do I do it? How do I do it? That's what they're going to say. You know what you say to them? I dare you. I dare you. You know what you say to them? You say, follow me. You don't say follow Christ. You say follow. I know everybody's like, oh, but I'm not perfect. That's blasphemy. But didn't the Apostle Paul say that? He says, follow me. You know, that's, that's the way, you know, matter of fact, I'm reading this new book talking about Christ to the nations. And it's talking about how back in the day when someone wanted to learn how to be a Christian, you know, because think about something. The Gospels, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they weren't written until like 80, 60, 80, 65. They weren't written until much time later. So at that time, how were people learning about Christ? How are they learning about following him? Well, of course, there was oral tradition. People were telling the stories. But how was I learning about how to be a Christian? Yes, in part, there was the Old Testament. But in many ways, all the apostles were saying was, follow us. Do what we do. We're following Christ. Follow us. Follow us as we follow Christ. And as you follow us, as we follow Christ, you will learn how to follow Christ. Follow me. Do what I did. Build a relationship with someone. Teach them the truth. Pray for them. Invite them to make a decision. You too will be able to win your own soul to Christ. But it starts with cultivation, planting, harvesting, and multiply. And I encourage everybody here, if you keep that in mind, you will see God using you in tremendous ways. I am done. Any questions, comments, thoughts, whatever. Was this helpful today a little bit? In some sort of way? All righty. We're all through. Let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for blessing us with the opportunity to, you know, I know this was a lot. Uh, of course, we won't be able to masticate this all at one time. But well, this was just a little way to get us all started in the process of learning how to be soul winners for your kingdom. And um, we won't be perfect at it. Uh, all of us don't naturally have a personality for it. Maybe we all don't have the friends for it. But if we just, all, you don't need our ability. You just need our availability. And so, Lord, I just want to pray as the song says, Lord, I'm available to you. My will I give to you. I'll do what you say. Do use me, Lord to show someone the way and enabled me to say, my storage is empty and I, I am available to you. Help us to all pray that prayer and being available to you, minister through us. Help us not to just depend on, depend on a minister, but help all of us to be the ministers. In your name we ask and pray, amen.
God bless everybody and have a good evening. We're going to be here.